As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. professional colleagues, friends of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, everyone listening today, everyone watching us live from every part of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we say good evening to you and you're welcome to another episode of ICANN On Air. Today is the first day of June 2023. We say happy new month to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope that you're telling someone to tell someone to tell someone to join us today so today um i'll say congratulations for being a part of june is media already and we hope for an exciting year and everything about the year will be good for us so today is going to be a great day because we're bringing in a friend of the house we're bringing in someone that will talk to us about everything that pertains to how we spend how we expand how we go about about our daily lives because someone is watching, right? So today on Icon on Air, our topic is IFRS based income tax computation in Nigeria. And we have someone interesting in the house. But before we bring in our erudite scholar, we would like to read his profile so we know who is coming into the studio very soon. So our guest today is. I call him doctor. I don't know why he doesn't want to own up. Or perhaps I should change it to professor. So um, Samuel Joseph Okoye is our guest today. And he has that wealth of experience in this topic that is mind-blowing. Topic that relates to how we spend everything about our work and that the tax man is watching. So I'll just read his profile to just put um, some interesting parts to who we are bringing on board today. So he has his work experience in banking industry, he's done retail, he's done commercial banking, and also he won the best customer-friendly officer. And you, you can tell what that means, is is about the passion for the work. So he's a pioneer financial controller of PHB PDC, BDC Limited, where he, sec he was seconded from P PHB PLC, and he has direct responsibility for managing financial assets worth over 3 billion naira in 2010. So um, our guest actually left the banking industry for Champs Consortium and is a chartered accountant and a chartered tax practitioner by academic and his professional trainings as OJ Samuel. So I would like to I would like us to go on the break before we unleash our doctor in the house, our professor of this subject matter. We'll say let's go on a break and we'll be right back with the guest in the studio. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining.
and thank you so much for joining us on Icon on Air today, the first day of June. So, you know, before the break, I told you we have someone that can kill the topic, right? So he's right here with us. Um, and today we're discussing IFRS-based income tax computation in Nigeria. So I'm happy to introduce to us Mr. Should I go down to say Mr. I'll say Dr. Uh, OJ Samuel, <laughs> the on, managing director, on. OJ Inspiration Limited. So you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for me. Talk to me. You keep pulling my leg, you know. I was getting uncomfortable with those introductions, but we are here. Um, so let's uh, let's get going. Thank you for having me, Anna. Thank, All right, thank you for finding me worthy to come on board once again. You are always welcome. You know, we've had you at several times on this um, program, and we know you can speak to the topic that we have at hand now. So, um, doctor, please just accept the doctor. <laughs> I've given you that that accreditation already. So, you know, while we while tax is globally considered as one of the key sources of government revenue. And its payment is a civic responsibility because when we define taxes, say, is it your civic responsibility? Is it your duty? It is the law. That's what we all say. You know, it's computation and compliance with the applicable standard is very important. And we always want to learn how to do it right. So what is international financial reporting standard, which we call IFRS? What, what can, how can you educate us or educate our viewers on the nexus between IFRS and income tax computation? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you know, if you go through our tax law, whether it's the personal income tax, act, whether it's the company income tax, or whether it's the CGT, whether it's the National Environmental Technology Development Levy, whether it's the, I mentioned the Pletora, Petroleum Industry Act 2021 and all that. A key requirement in all of this law is that in assessing for tax, it is the responsibility of the taxpayer to keep records, proper records, to enable the assessment of the proper taxes. So what is primary for an individual of a business is that records are kept, right? So on the issue of IFRS, when it comes to businesses and companies, for the purpose of uniformity, for the purpose of a, a global framework, for the purpose of a comparability of financial statements or business information in numerical or economic term, this is a framework that stipulates the guidelines, the standards that will be followed in preparing and presenting financial statements. The essence is to ensure that there is uniformity and there is comparability in the approach used in the preparation and presentation of financial statement. Now, the nexus. The nexus is this. Assessment on, for tax purposes are based on the records the law require you to keep, right? So having, having kept that record in such a manner, and we are now in a framework, we are now in an era where we use the IFRS. So assessment for taxes, assessment for taxes in line with Nigeria law is based on financial statement. The source, the input that forms the basis for the information for the financial economic transition that are set, right, are based on financial statements. And those statements in our time now are prepared based on IFRS. Therefore, there is a nexus because financials are presented or prepared and presented within certain framework. The framework we have in place in Nigeria now is IFRS. And those financials are now assessed to tax based on our tax law. Hence the need to connect the relationship between financial statement pre 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 prepared and presented under IFRS and the tax law, which we take as input those financial for assessment to proceed upon. That is the nexus. Thank you. Interesting. Now you know you're a professor. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> I, 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 I got all of the... <laughs> <laughs> so for the benefit of our audience, right, um, we have a global audience here that may not be doing the Nigerian taxes, but right here we want to understand, uh, can you put us through on um, some of the income tax laws that have their basis on items reported in IFRS financial statements? Uh, thank you. Um, flowing from the first assumption I've given, when you assess a financial, when you assess a taxpayer based on the records you are kept, they have kept, you take their figures, you take their amounts, you assess their transactions, or you consider their transactions in assessing them for taxes, right? So yes. now, um, under our common income tax act, the law talks about accessible profit, 
right? Accidental profits, total profits, profits made from all sources after certain adjustments required under the tax law gives you what you call total profit. The question is, from the financial prepared by an entity, where do you get the impute base, the impute tax base on which consideration or adjustments are made before you arrive at that total profit or total profit or any of the other profit bases as contained in the various tax law? So, CETA, you hear about total profits, right? But to arrive at that proper total profit, you have to pick the accounting profit, right? What you used to call net profit, uh, we don't use that word net again, because there are various profit line items. You are going to pick that profit and adjust in order to arrive at the accessible profit, as the case may be, and ultimately at the total or taxable profit. So CETA stipulates the basis or the kind of profit that is considered, but there is an accounting nexus which serves as the impute before amendment are made to get to that point. Now let's go to personal income tax act, right? You know, talk about the gross income, right? Under our under our tax law, we talk about gross income, right? Income from all sources adjusted for all categories of income that are tax exempt or that are not taxable or that are released or expenses allowable. Court City Finance Act, it gave a redefinition of what gross income is. Now, when you look at the financial of a one-man business, for example, right? If you look at the financial, you consider all the income made, whether as revenue or as other income, or any other income they must have made, whether end on end, right? These are some of the snippets of the content of Peter, right, that can only be arrived at when you plug it into the financial records of a taxpayer under personal income tax assessment to arrive at this basis under personal income tax act for the purposes of assessment and determination of ultimate tax liability. Same thing goes for um, capital gains tax act, right? They talk about chargeable assets. What are the assets that are chargeable? Is it everything? No, it is not everything that is a chargeable asset, right? There are exemptions. But when you look at the case of the financial, we should be able to trace, right? Now, this gain made on the disposal, does this gain constitute a chargeable gain under the CGTA that is company um, capital gains tax act, right? Or does it not constitute? Right, so we, you need to know where to look at in the face of the financial to say, okay, this is an item presented within other income or whether it's other compressor income or whether should we trace it back to somewhere in the state of changes in equity? Is there something right between the results that suggests that a disposal, a chargeable, a capital gain, you know, a chargeable capital gain has been made? Right, so these are some of the best. If you go to the Petroleum Profit Tax Act, right, we talk about accessible profit, chargeable profit, accessible tax, uh, you know, all of those stuff, right? Those are the prescriptions of the Petroleum Profit Tax Act, and also prescription. We have about hydrocarbon tax now, and a yeah. whole lot under the Petroleum Industry Act. So, this basis, right, can only be arrived at when you plug it into the records. Or financials of entity, you are just in line with the provisions of this law to arrive at the tax item for the purpose of tax income tax assessment in Nigeria. Interesting. So yes, thank you so much. You know, when some of the friends of chartered accountants, we call them FCA, right? When they yes. come about, I mean, when we have meetings and they say, I don't have profit. I don't have income. You know, they don't really know the difference between taxable income and accounting income. So, thank you so much for so, for putting some light in in that question. So, you know, from the Nigerian perspective, now the Nigerian FRS um, Federal Inland Revenue Service is there any law? Is there any rule? Or would you say is there any other any regulation any circular by the FIRS on the adoption adoption of IFRS in Nigeria. Have you come about anyone? Uh, yes, it exists. You see, Nigeria adopted IFRS in 2012. We had a roadmap that stipulated companies that were to adopt IFRS by December 31st year ending 2012. We had another category. Uh, the, the first category was especially for public interest entities, PIEs, right? Now, we had the second category of um, certain significant interest entity who were required to have adopted the line with the roadmap by December 31, 2013. Then the last set, 
a kind of omnibus, omnibus collection of entities that are required to have adopted IFRS by December 1, 2014. So that is the picture of the framework we had in Nigeria. Envisaging the financials of businesses, of companies, of organizations in Nigeria from 2014 up to now will be based on IFRS. The Federal Land Revenue Service issued a circular in March 2013. And that circular is titled um, Tax Implications of IFRS Adoption in Nigeria. Tax Implications of IFRS Adoption in Nigeria. So in that circular, what did the FRS do? Please not so confuse FRS and IFRS. Same letter, different you know, placement of um, you know, uh, abbreviation, right? So yes. Federal Inland Revenue Service, FRS, issued a circular in March 2018, what did they do? They understand that we are no longer in line, we are no longer in an era where we're using what you call the NSAS, the Nigerian State of Accounting Standards. Mm -hmm. Those were the existing standards, the existing framework that were followed in the preparation and presentation of financial statements for which as well for tax were made, right? But from 2013, 14, 15, 2012, 13, 14 onward. So the financials, prepared right and up to now are now based on ifrs therefore for the purpose of the tax implication the ifrs proactively issued a circular stating that having prepared or as you prepare your account based on ifrs these are the adjustments you are to make to your financials right mm. when you are to ascertain company income tax minimum tax Tertiary education tax, even on VAT, even those are consumption transaction, right? They are not income taxes, and even capital gain tax. So based on all these, um, all those um, provisions, right? These are these are what are to comply with for all of the standards. So they listed all of the standards that have quantitative implication. Some standards are just disclosure standards. They do not deal with arriving at the figure, e.g., IS twenty four. Related party disclosure. It talks about disclosure. It doesn't tell you to debit or credit or to quantify anything. Same thing goes with IFRS 12, disclosure of interest in other entities, right? So it doesn't tell you debit or credit. So some standards are just disclosure standards. So what the FRS did was to pick on the standard that had quantitative implication. Quantitative meaning when you apply this standard, it's going to affect the way you determine your profit for the year. Your loss of the year, your your what you call equity, what we use to call shareholders fund under our gap, and all of that. So they pick those quantitative standards and not give a position where you have done this in line with IFRS, which is okay. But for tax in income tax purposes, this is not allowable. That is not allowable. This should be adjusted. This should be shown. So there is a circular. That circular was issued in March 2013 that covered all standards that existed at that point. Afterwards, mm -hmm. some standard had been issued, right, by the International Accounting Standard Board, right? We have, I, um, we have, um, um, you know, IFRS 14, IFRS 15, 16, and the latest one, IFRS 17. No cycle had been issued to accommodate the new dimension of this new standard, but they can be gleaned from the principle contained in that cycle issued by IFRS that covered all the existing standards up to 2013. Thank interesting, you. interesting, sir. Um, you know, while you were answering that question, I saw someone send the message and acknowledge you as the tutor from Time Memorial. So now we know we have Dr. OJ Samuel in the studio. And um, <laughs> you know, as a as a teacher and a coach, a lot of people know you to be their teacher. And I agree, I agree with them. W what would you say those secular in particular? Did it really impact or how can you say, how can you educate us on how we can demonstrate that those secular that you have mentioned here that it impact on some of the IFRS? Yeah, uh, we are going to select some. We are going to select some. Yes, because I won't leave here today, right? We can't, the one hour is there enough, the two hours is there enough, right? Yes. But we are going to pick some, right? So, you know, um, as we speak now, um, we are talking to our global audience, right? How many IFRSs do we have currently that are mandatorily applicable? In total, in total, they are, generally, there are 41, 
right? Now, but then before I explain, now when I say 41, I am including IS 39, which is on financial instrument, recognition and measurement. That standard has been replaced by IFRS 9 with a caveat. There's a provision within IS 39 called a hedge accounting, right? There is a prescription in that standard that stipulates how hedge accounting should be reported. For entity that had gone into financial instrument transaction that were reporting under the former provision of IS39, and those transactions still exist in their financials. So the standard say that standard applies until such transactions are exhausted or they are derecognized or they are exited. Right? So ordinarily, IS39 no longer apply. But where you have commenced the application of the head accounting framework under IS39, you are bound to keep applying it until you run out that financial transaction or that financial asset or liability, as the case may be, you know, is derecognized from the financial. So if you back at IS39, we have 40, 40 applicable 40. IFRSs. 40. Now, not 41 because IFRS 7 on insurance contract replaces IFRS 4 insurance contract and that becomes effective this year. So if you back up the IS39 that has a certain feature, maybe, maybe not, right? Take up IS39, which is, um, you know, which is um, situational. We have 40 mandatory applicable standards. That is why I've said that this one hour tower is not enough to begin to dissect, to demonstrate the implication. But we're going to take a few of them. For example, IS2. IS2 is a standard on inventory. And what does it say on the valuation of inventory at the end of a period? It says you value your inventory at the level of what? Costs Cost. and naturalizable value. That is the provision of paragraph nine of IS2. At the year end or period end, as the case may be, you have to value your stock at either the lower of cost or naturalizable value. Now let's take an example. You have a cost of an item that, is, that, that has a cost of 10,000 Naira at cost. And you are a supermat or a hypermat, right? When you are doing a revaluation based on IS2, you now say, really, the naturalizable value for this item is really not 10,000 naira. It is 8,000 naira. In line with IS2, what you are required to do, right? What you are required to do is to now say, okay, do you know what? I'm going to credit my inventory for 2,000 and debit my cost of sales for 2,000. Why are you creating your inventory for 2,000? You are creating your inventory for 2000 to bring down the balance from 10,000 to 8,000 because that is the naturalizable value. That is one hand. On the other hand, you have debited your cost of sale. What happened? By debiting your cost of sales, ultimately it will reduce your gross profit and move down to reduce your net profit or your accounting profit. But what does the circle are saying? Where does they write down on our inventory from cost to naturalizable value? That write down should be disallowed. So in line with IFRS, you have done what IS2 says, but in line with the cycler, for example, that is not allowable because that writes down, you've not actually sold the product to experience that loss. It's only notional. It's only provisional. It's only assumed. So that 2,000 I write down, which are trying to expense through cost of sale, will be disallowed. That is just one example on IS2. So I, the time is not enough. I, 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 I know we would have a lot. <laughs> I know we would have a lot of those, yes. In fact, yeah. you're breaking it down like we're really in the classroom. And for our audience, if you're not with your writing pen or your writing notepad, then you are totally wrong. We have a lot to learn from this session. So get your pens and your books ready to write and to take notes because we may have questions for you too. So while we wait for people to send in their questions, I guess we would like to go on a break and um, we'll be right back shortly. Remember, we have Dr. O.J. Summer in the <laughs> studio <laughs> and we are discussing <laughs> IFRS based income tax computation in Nigeria. We'll be right back.
finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. minutes thereabouts we've been discussing IFRS income based tax in Nigeria and um, again we have Dr. OJ Samuel <laughs> uh, in the studio and I can I can bet that we all have been writing we have a lot to write on this topic one thing that can I, I took out from the previous session is that we have about 40 IFRS um, mandatory or applicable IFRS, unlike um, what other people think. And we know that this um, program is for us to learn. We need to learn and learn and learn so that we'll be relevant in our areas and in our professional um, career. So thank you so much again, Dr. OJ. We have questions. I believe a lot of people have been asking questions. I'd like to acknowledge some of our viewers here. Machu Kalu from Port Harcourt, we say you're welcome. And we've been having a lot of people comment about your level of um, training today. I would call it training because you've taken us to the classroom. And Ola Kunle Shogbetun, he says, good evening and thank you for the insightful session. My question is on impairment of receivables and the income tax law. Doctor, over to you, sir. Uh, for me, yeah, don't worry, I'll find you, um, uh, Mr. Place. So let's go ahead. Impairment. Now, when we talk about impairment, there are two categories of impairment. We have impairment for um, financial assets. We have impairment for non-financial assets, right? So impairment for non-financial assets, which you directly call impairments, is um, covered by IAS 36 impairment, right? Now, when we talk about impairment for financial assets, like the trade receivables they mentioned, that comes under the provision of IFRS 9, right? IFRS 9, impairment. Our impairment is done. So this is it. There are two categories of impairment for both of tax purposes, right? When you do all those evaluations, you say a credit, credit loss model that you anticipate whether the customer's condition, whether that is the significant increase in the credit risk of that party from the last reporting date to the current date or from the date the transaction, the credit was granted to a particular date, whether there's a significant increase or there's no significant decrease or whether the customer is uh, meeting up with his obligation, you now decide to do what we call, you know, um, impairment provisioning. You will have what we call um, 12 months, 12 month life, uh, 12 months, ECL modeling, and you have a lifetime. Whichever one you do under IFRS now, you come down to impairment, meaning you are writing out certain amount of money because you are taking a proactive stand that this amount will not be recoverable. That is what impairment is under IFRS 9, right? Under the Experience Credit Loss Model. Now, because of that concept of Experience Credit Loss Model, for tax purposes, the only impairment allowable for the purpose of any receivable is an impairment that has crystallized. Only when a debt is a bad debt, bad debt, not provision, not doubtful, not estimable, not all of those things. When you are doing something provisional, something estimated, something futuristic, something assumed, you are trying to mirror the expected, look at the word, expected credit loss model, 
in the anyway, let's talk about the former standard. What we have now is a very credit loss model. So any impairment to arrive at that is not as a result of an actual debt going bad, it is not allowable for income tax purposes. But in your accounting record, you know what you have done. You will have created the accumulated impairment account, as the case may be, or your allowance of credit losses, right? You will have credited it and debited your profit or loss, as the case may be. So your debiting your profit or loss reduces your accounting profit, directly reducing your taxable profit. For tax purposes, such impairment will be disallowed. In other words, what you debited to that profit or loss or impairment will be added back in the computation to arrive at an accessible or total profit. That is the position. Only when an impairment is an actual crystallization, a, a debt has gone bad. Probably the debtor is dead, a company has wound up, right? Or there's an operation of the law that makes it clear that this debt is not recoverable. Then why you are why you still call it impairment under IFRS 9, under the tax law, those are crystallized debt, bad debt right that are allowable but where that is not the case any form of impairment whatsoever arrive that using our ecl model as well as credit loss model under IFRS now is not allowable under the income tax for energy unless they've crashed a lot that is the response to that question thank you thank you sir so um i have zainab abdul karim she has a question she says good evening and thank you for the insightful session my question is are corporate gifts and client entertainment expenses allowable under the current finance act now thank you now in the current finance act from 2019 2020 2021 um did not only really double into um, um, certain existing kind of expense, whether they're allowable or not. Now, the law is clear. Four filters, right? Is it necessary? Right? Right? Is it holy? Holy? Is it exclusive? Right? So, and is it, um, 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 I was, uh, you know, reasonable. we call it rent. Reasonable. Yeah, right? Reasonable. So, that is a function of the existing provision of whether it's the Petroleum Profit Tax Act, CETA, that is coming income tax act or the personal income tax act. So the new finance act did not, it only came up with issue of um, okay, um, that this other um stuff of um, um what they call it, um, um, you know, real estate investment scheme, payment of principal interest. So it didn't dabble into that. That is still an existing issue. The question is from your consideration, was it really necessary or is it necessary? Is it only is it exclusive? Is it even reasonable? right so it is judgmental in the context so when you give a bouquet of something a biro a book or something um that may not be a headache but what is a corporate yeah. gift and give a lot to someone in mowo and potakot in name of corporate gift that raises an eyebrow right so those four yeah. tests of allowability should guide the judgment Thank, Thank you, you, Doc. So, you know, um, deferred tax is, a, is another area in tax which looks somehow, people tend it to be very complex and many professionals try to shy away from it. Um, as someone who has a very good understanding of the Nigerian tax system, has the integration of Nigeria's tax law with IFRS given rise to deferred tax in any form? Yeah, um, yes, if you, um, DIVA tax has always been there. Um, with the introduction of the Finance Act, new more items have come into DIVA tax consideration. Number one, if you look at the provision of um, the Finance Act, I can't remember section 18 or so, but it amended section 77 of the Common Income Tax Act with respect to bonus, right? Bonus available to an earlier payer of income tax obligation. And that provision say when you pay 90 day before the expected due date of filing, you are entitled to a certain percentage of bonus on the amount of income tax paid. Where you are a medium sized company and you are paying before, let's say June 30th. Now June, you are already in June, June 30th. You are paying 90 day before June 30th. Where June 30th is your six month after the end of the accounting year, or is the 18th month from your date of incorporation, as the case may be. Whatever the case, when you are paying 90 days before that day, you are entitled to 2% of the income tax paid. In other words, 
where you have paid um, you know um two million for example two percent of two million is the bonus that will be given to you under the new tax law right where you are a large company or other category of company you are that a one percent bonus for early payment of taxes when you paid 90 days uh, or not before 90 days before your due date now this is the implication for all nigerian companies i say all for all nigerian companies that make payment for income taxes and um, you know within 90 days before that's where due date they enjoy that bonus. Now, this is the way the bonus works. The bonus does not say, okay, you're supposed to pay one million naira in June 30th. Deduct the bonus, pay the balance. No, the, 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 the bonus is pay the one million naira. Now, 2% of that one million, you know, you've already paid the one million, 2% of that one million will be available as a relief in the next cycle of payments you have to make. It is not like in the immediate, so, okay, let me net it. No, you must have paid this 2% or 1% of the case may be will be available for you as a relief in the future when you have to pay that of the following year. Therefore, for this bonus availability for earlier or for early bed payer of income taxes within or before 90 days to an expect due date, deferred tax arises for the exact amount. Why is it deferred tax? Because in the future, in the future, that amount will reduce your future income tax liability. Deferred tax asset automatically arises. Take note, it is not a current tax. If it were a current tax, you'll be able to net off at the present time, at the date of reporting. Yes. It is not current, right? It's not a case of your own utilized withholding tax credit note. No, it's not a, it is a deferred tax because you're being entitled to the benefit. If against the future payments you are going to make, you are going to net that off before paying that balance in the future, not for the current period. For which are complying within the 90 day cycle payment before the fair due date. So, deferred tax arises by the virtue of that provision of amendment to section 77 of the Common Income Tax Act by Finance Act 2019. Right? Thank that you. is number one. Yes. Number two, okay, quickly, uh, number two, you know, we, 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 we hear about team capitalization, right? You know, we hear about if the interest you are paying to a connected foreign loan is more than 30%. Of your EBITDA, ending before interest and tax and depreciation and amortization. If it is more than 30%, the finance act says, you know what? That excess, you need to carry it forward, defy it. Meaning you cannot use all your money in quote to pay for interest on a foreign loan from a connected party, from a related entity. You cannot. So any excess are you know above 30% of your earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. That asset should be carried forward. Deduct it from the future profit of the company. No longer in the current year because you have hit the 30% bar, yeah. right? So that excess, with the law, so you can't deduct now, but you can deduct in the future. It forms the base. It forms the base for different tax assets. Why? Because in the future, in the future, you will be allowed to deduct that amount before determining your ultimate future income tax liability. So that 30% limit on your EBITDA as a provision of finance act, right, creates a deferred tax asset, which is 30% of that amount or 20% if you're responsible for that amount automatically. So these are the two new triggers coming in into the window of deferred tax by virtue of the finance act that we have today. All other things remain as deferred tax as before. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you so much for bringing that to our knowledge. Thank you, Doc. So remember, you can still send your questions in. We have some questions already, but um, I, I just want to ask you because we all face this every time. Um, are there any tax audits or tax investigation footprints that can be traced to IFRS financial statements? Yes, um, and uh, those in FRS, you listen clearly, and those in um, certain direct revenue services, from any financial prepared and presented under IFRS, you have tax audits and tax investigation footprint, all true. This is the meaning. I don't need to see how you computed your income tax. I don't need to see how you did your capital allowance. I don't need to, if your financials are prepared and presented in line with IFRS, and you have followed the disclosure, from your disclosure, which are required by ISF, I can tell you every single thing you have done 
in the process of arriving at your company income tax, cash education tax, capital gain tax, or any form of taxes whatsoever. Let me give an example. One of the disclosures required, right, by paragraph 82 and paragraph 88 of IS 2F is that the, the standard says you should do a reconciliation between the applicable tax rates, right, and the average effective tax rate. Now, when you are to comply with that disclosure, that disclosure, a lot of people do not know. See, that disclosure is aimed at ensuring that the reader of your financial can connect. In Nigeria, we say it is 30% of your total profit. But most times, when you use 30% to multiply your accounting profit before tax, it does not give you the amount presented as tax expense or as tax income in the financial. It doesn't. It always never or rarely ever, if it ever does, right? Therefore, that provision or paragraph, um, um, you know, paragraph um, 8288G of IS-12 says you must give a reconciliation between the applicable tax rates and how it became the average effective tax rate. Now, to do that reconciliation, you are going to start by saying, okay, applicable accounting profit is this. In that reconciliation, you are going to tell us the tax effects on non-allowable item. You are going to tell us the tax effects of a liable item, the tax effect on capital allowance, the tax effect on um, revision, right? Either over revision or under revision from previous tax paid, and then the different tax. So, for anyone who has an investigative audit trait, when you pick this item, right, and you gross them up, you can come to a conclusion as to the amount of non allowable expenses considered in the compensation of that client or the amount considered in the non-taxable income, in the capital allowance, you can walk back to get the figure and compare what you have in your in, in the tax records of, uh, of that taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need to go into any form of argument. And I want to advise our colleagues who we'll do all this, you know, in Yoruba language, say we we'll do what we call Joma. You know, the Joma balancing. Guru, when guru. you are coming, <laughs> you just put on figure. Let it now net off. Right? So if someone who is sound knows that, see, what you have done is not the basis. Because if I walk back, I'll be able to trace the absolute amount, mm -hmm. the sum of your non-allowable item for that period, the sum of your non-taxable income for that period, the sum of your capital allowances claimed, and the capital allowance even deferred, carry forward, where you're having this 62, you know, this 62 to 30 percent limit. So yes. it has a lot of traces for tax audit and investigation for a tax administrator who understands it. Thank mm. you. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, I have an interesting question in my, on my screen. This new law of tax clearance before PTA, which is the personal travel allowance, how does it affect individuals who don't have jobs? Now, the question is that you do not have a job. Maybe you do not have a regular job, right? But the question is, you want to apply for a PTA. They, you know, if you are a student, it, it is understandable, right? You are a minor, but someone is sponsoring you. You know, nobody applies a PT where you do not have any business going overseas. You are going for something, right? Let's say it's a medical treatment, for example, right? Let's say it's a medical, medical tourism, for example. Someone is sponsoring that purchase of Forex. Is that okay? Yeah, someone is sponsoring it. So whoever is sponsoring the purchase, it's not about you, the student, who is trying to pay school fees. It's not about you, the patient. Who is trying to go for treatment? It's not about you and um, the under age tourist who is following the parent. No, someone is funding the purchase of that personal traveling allowance. Therefore, whoever that is funding him will have earned income, not necessarily from, a, from, from, from an employeeship, not necessarily an earned income, and not necessarily from employment. It could be from self employment, it could be from other forms of income. Therefore, for every income that is earned, or the, rather that is made, whether end on end or through other sources, of course, you ought to obtain a task allowance for it. That is legit, it's legal and respected because you have no business with Forex where you couldn't have earned the income in Naira, they enable you to make a purchase or demand for Forex for PTA. Okay, everything keeps changing. Yes, this is the new regime and this is the new law. You must have your tax clearance before you get PTA. And so I have um, Leko Daramola here, um, here and he says, please, are direct procurement and cash advances taxable? If yes, 
from which amount? I know we are running out of time, but yes, I will attend to the question. Now, when you make advance payments, two parties are involved, right? From the perspective of the person making the payment, from the perspective from the person receiving the payment, right? Now, from the perspective of the person receiving the payment, the question is, have you supplied the product or service? Or is it just a case of a deposit liability in your financial? I'm speaking to this from the perspective of IFRS 15. From the perspective of the seller that has collected an advance payment, right? We call, we call it a deposit liability. For the person of the seller, the recipient, it is called a deposit liability. That word is used, that expression is used under that standard to emphasize that the expected goods and service has not been offered or supplied, mm. right, to the payer. Therefore, it will not even come in into your revenue in your financials. It will not come in into your revenue. The elementary accounting entry is to debit your bank for that amount and credit or deposit liability. Simple. That is accounting entry. It does not flow into your revenue. Because it does not flow into your revenue, it does not dovetail into any kind of profit whatsoever. Mm. Now, the problem arises where you've collected money, you supply partially, or you supply some, and you now want to treat it as a deposit liability. No, not everything is a deposit liability because you have rendered the associated you supply the accompanying goods or services, and therefore that portion of revenue concerns the services supplied or the goods delivered must be brought, the profit element or revenue element must be brought into the book. So mm. from the perspective of the payer, from the payer, they are not in other simplification. The question is, are you doing, is this something that qualifies for withholding tax? At the point of payment, are you there? So the question okay. of is it over the counter? Is it a contract? Is it that comes into consideration? Mm -hmm. That is the only thing okay. that will define and enable you to ascertain whether you are to withhold a certain percentage in line with the withholding tax regulation or not. Okay. But these are the two sides to it. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. So, you know, I'm checking my time alongside understanding that we have a lot of questions from our audience and I personally have questions. So um, I, I just want to ask you a question just based on the Finance Act. You know, there are assertions by some Nigerians that the Finance Acts have been deliberately geared towards punishing both individuals and corporate citizens. And also, if we can relate it with the small and medium sized companies, what are the specific income tax implications from from all this IFRS, the financial statement, how should they come up and go about it? Thank you. Um, in, 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 in all factuality, the Finance Act has given a leeway and a breaching space to small businesses where your turnover, your annual turnover is no more than 25 million or less than 25 million. Your profit is exempted, exempted from income tax in Nigeria exempted what does that mean in either in any way you prepare your financial whichever framework you have followed so long as your annual your gross you know your turnover right in a year is not is less than 25 million you are exempted from any form of income taxes so whether you've applied ifrs or not does not even affect it the question is when you file your account with the your relevant tax office, we are going to look at the financial to ensure that there is no deliberate engineering program to ensure that you're under reporting revenue or gross turnover, as the case may be, right? But apart from a small company, it is Uhuru in terms of not having that burden to pay any form of income taxes. The same thing goes to the attention return tax. They are exempted under the Project of Finance Act. For a small company, the implication of this is this. You know, where your turnover is above 25 million, but below 100 million, right? The applicable rate is just 20%. 20%, not 30%, right? So, but let's take note a company may be a small company in year one, yeah. and year two become a medium sized company. It's not static. That is why you have to file yearly, whether you're exempted or not. The law does not exempt anyone from filing their return. You have to file yearly. We are in holistic consideration. Your turnover is makes you not a small company and you become a medium sized company or a big one. You have to pay the associated taxes for a medium sized 20 percent, 
for a large company, 30%. But for a small company, you know, IFRS or no IFRS does not affect their income tax liability because they're exempted so long as their annual gross earning, right, is less than 25 million. Bracket. Yeah, mm. bracket, that is the law. All right. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, I, 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 I honestly wish you could stay for a longer time than we have on the program. But um, just to close out on this, and you know, a lot of changes is coming on board. In I mean, Nigeria is changing. There's a change in government and every other thing happening to Nigeria. So, you know, based on your deep and your practical knowledge of Nigeria's economy, is Nigeria's fiscal federalism positively working? What do you think? And if it's not working, what do you think? Or how do you think they can go about it? How can we make this change? Um, um, this is a politically, uh, politically sensitive um, issue. Um, fiscal federalism. What is fiscal federalism? Uh, we need to reach an agreement as to the definition and meaning. If I'm a federal government worker now, or I occupy a federal office, my interpretation will show is going to you know come up with something that is far away from what a state administrator or a governor has as a fiscal federalism. Or if I'm a, I'm a, if I'm a governor in a state that in quotes seem not to have anything local, anything I can rely on by way of um, IGR, by way of um, resources, I'm going to have a different explanation. So the first point is we need to come together to agree on the working definition in Nigeria of what fiscal federalism is. That is the first point. Does it mean that each state or each state has the power constitutionally to control resources that is within its domain? Or does it mean that if they have the power to control to control classified category of resources within its domain? Am I in charge of my crude oil? Am I in charge of um, this determining the mining right, living right to our world? I'm not at the state governor. The PIA stipulates something entirely different. The gold is on fire, for example. Is it within my power as a state governor to mine the gold and sell and pocket it and heaven does not fall? So you see, it's a whole lot of politically charged issue, right? So we need to start with agreeing in the context of our reality as Nigeria, what is fiscal federalism? Yeah. When we agree on that, before we can form a basis to begin to make informed comments or conclusion mm -hmm. thereon. That is my opinion because the jumping the gun will be jumping in order to just begin to analyze where we've not agreed. All of us went to school. The first chapter you do your project or thesis, look about definition of terms. The purpose is to ensure that we are on the same page before considering your literature review and every other analysis you are going to do afterwards. Yes. So we need to come to a, an agreement on what fiscal federalism is, especially as the new government um, you know, commences its journey. Thank That's you. our lecturer speaking, O.J. Samuel. Thank you so much, sir. So mm -hmm. in wrapping up, I'll say thank you so much for being part of this program. But, you know, in wrapping up, how can you advise our professional colleagues? How can you advise the Institute itself on how we can um, give back, you know, when it comes to um, the Nigerian business environment? How can we ensure that accountancy profession is sustained and even that we do the right thing in terms of knowledge gap of IFRS or business or base income tax computation? Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Now, we need to be creative. We need to be entrepreneurial. You know, some things are given. Some things are mundane. We must act as business partners, bringing value to the table, not trying to be dubious, not trying to shortchange the law for personal benefits, right? We are trying to say we must bring our creativity, our entrepreneurial mindset in the things that we do okay. in such a way that, it, that, that there is a balance, right? between the business growth and development and the larger common interest. Well, you know, there was no time. We didn't break into all of the components of these standards and the IFRS implication. We didn't. I cited IS2 inventor as one. There are implications for IS16, property plan equipment, right? There are all componentization on the IS16, right? That okay. says, you know, certain component of a global or full assets that meet certain criteria should be reported separately and distinctly. But under a tax law, what does the circular say? The circular say, whatever it is that component you are, you are, you are treating as a component, it will be worth 20% of the total value. Mm. So we didn't consider so many other because of time. Right, so my so. point is, 
Check my accountant should be creative, they must be entrepreneurial, and they must bring a business partner mindset to mm, add value to their clients and then to the government for the oh, purpose wow. of you know, common good. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for being part of today's program. We truly, deeply appreciate your time um, here and everything that you have taught us. So we'll say thank you and we appreciate you. We hope next time we will be there for us. All right. In wrapping up today, thank you. thank you so much, everyone, for being part of the program. I just have a few announcements to make. Um, forensic accounting certification training. It's an hybrid program. It's coming up at ICANN Annex Oingo, and it's 2,000, 250,000 Naira. And we also have um, another program, IT and Consulting Faculty Webinar. Please reach out to the Institute for every training that you want to be part of. And in conclusion, I want to say congratulations to our 59th president, um, Dr. Innocent Okosa, and we say congratulations to you and we wish you a great tenure. Everyone, we want to say thank you so much, um, your host today, Fumi Olani, and thank you so much for being part of us. In closing, we'll say um, happy new month, and we hope that this month brings you new things. Remember to learn and to learn and to learn so that you'll be valuable in everything that you lay your hands on. Have a good evening, everyone, and thank you once more.